Now it's time to go in a different direction. After talking in the last uh, 12 days of OTR Central Christmas about nine women of wrestling I can fat to, today we're going to get slightly more serious here. We're going to talk about eight wrestlers who I feel should have been WWE champion. That's not people World Heavyweight Championship or WCW champion. I'm talking about WWF slash WWE champion. That's the belt. So a couple of these guys were WCW champions or World Heavyweight champions in the WWE. Um, but that's not counting. I'm talking about holding the biggest belt, the WWF slash WWE championship. And these eight guys, to me, all stand out. And, you know, they stand out for different reasons. Some because they never got the opportunity. Some because they pissed potential opportunities down their legs. Some due to this or that. The bottom line is all eight. I feel should have been WWE champions at some point in time. You guys are welcome to chime in on the topic as well in the comments section below. I'm sure some of you will agree with most of the names on my list. You might throw some different ones out there because, they're, frankly, there are more than eight individuals that I could definitely classify in this category. But let's get started here. And I'm going to start off with Ron Simmons. This is one that's always bothered me tremendously. You've got a guy who was a legit All-American at Florida State. You know, he has his rich jersey retired by the Seminoles. He was one of Bobby Bowden's first really great players down there in Tallahassee. He was a guy that finished in the top 10 in the Heisman voting his senior year. At one point in time, he was WCW's world champion. And not only that, he was the first black world champion of a major national wrestling company. So when the WWF brought him in in the mid-90s, they put a fucking gladiator helmet on. Why would you do that? This was a guy with a legit athletic background who had been a world champion somewhere else, and most everybody knew it. And you bring him in, and you put a gladiator helmet on him. And then later on, you have him be the leader of the nation of domination. And at that point in time, you look at it, and you think, you know, he's got a big faction behind him with people like The Rock and Mark Henry and D'Lo Brown. You, know, you look at the individuals that were involved in that group, you're like, well, you have the faction to reinforce the fact that the top guy, the leader of that group for a period of time, maybe should have the top bill. And it just never happened. You know, Later on, he would do some great tag team work with uh, JBL as part of the APA. But the bottom line is it always irked me that Ron Simmons really never got a chance to sniff WWF championship gold. And that still bothers me a little bit to this day. I'm sure there are pigment reasons for it because, frankly, I can't really see why – what other reasons there would be. He was a WCW world champion, a legit amateur athlete, and yet we can't find a way to even give him a short transitional world title reign as WWF champion. Uh, Mr. Perfect, you know, this goes without saying. Him and Roddy Roddy Piper both. These are both guys I feel like you could have made a tremendous argument for being WWF champion for at least one short run. But when you look at Roddy Piper and his time in the mid-'80s, that was when Hulkamania was taking off and going international. So, And then Piper started to want to go off and do his own things, and he didn't take wrestling as serious. He was more of a part-time guy going to do movies and other stuff, and that's fine. And it probably affected his chance of ever being a world champion. But should he have been maybe in the mid-'80s right as Hulkamania was taking off? Yeah, probably. Mr. Perfect, again, he was a victim of circumstances situation. You know, when he was getting his big monster push, you had people like Savage and Hogan and Warrior. So it was going to be a very, very hard road to hold to become the world champion in the WWF at the time, especially when you had those top guys there and then Mr. Perfect was having his own injury problem. But he's definitely a guy in terms of all-around talent. He had the look. He had the in-ring ability. He had the mic skills. He had the charisma. He had everything you needed to at least have gotten some type of short world championship reign. And it just never happened. Two guys... For the WWF in the mid-90s that I felt should have held the belt for different reasons, one was Vader, an international star, former WCW champion, champion over in Japan. Everybody knew who the fuck Vader was. But yet when you bring him into the WWF in 96, he's jobbing out to Shawn Michaels at SummerSlam. What the fuck? When you had the perfect opportunity, a monster, a 400-pound monster, that the WWF always loved to feature. They loved the big, larger-than-life personalities, the huge monsters. And here's fucking Vader, Big Van Vader, staring you right in the damn face. And you can't find a way to make him the WWF champion in 96. Because you just have to have Shawn Michaels go over him at SummerSlam. You should have had a big, long program with them, you know, SummerSlam. And then maybe it caps off at Survivor Series. Or you carry the shit on to the Royal Rumble. At that time, you still could do it. 
It'd be much better if you have a Shawn Michaels chasing a Vader when Vader's the champion. The fact that they never put the belt on Vader still astounds me to this day. What a missed opportunity for the WWF. And speaking of missed opportunities, I always felt Owen Hart got jobbed and robbed. Because in 94, you have this big storyline between him and Bret Hart. This is biblical shit. This is Kane. This is Abel. And Owen was an incredibly talented individual. And my thing was, is that in that whole feud that he had with Bret the Hitman Hart, at some point in time, maybe you could have done it at SummerSlam of 94, you could have had Owen Hart win the belt, and he would have been a good champion at that time, because let's face it, business already wasn't good to begin with during that period. It wasn't like Owen Hart being the champion was going to make it a whole lot worse. In fact, it might have made it a whole lot more interesting, because you would have had a babyface Bret Hart chasing after his brother, the heel holding the belt, the babyface chasing that old NWA philosophy and mentality would have been in play here in the WWF, and it might have even improved business a little bit. I always thought the WWE desperately, desperately needed to make Owen Hart the champion for at least a two or three month stretch in 94, because it would have added so many more facets and layers to the Brett versus Owen, Kane versus Abel kind of storyline. I mean, imagine how much better it would have been if Owen was the champion at some point in time. It would have been a, a defining moment in his career. This is the same guy that beat Brett straight up 100% clean at WrestleMania 10 earlier that year. So the fact that he couldn't beat him when the bell was on the line to me was completely ludicrous and ridiculous. I still can't believe the company never did it. You know, I look at Ahmed Johnson. And I see a guy that had so many things going for him on the surface, it appeared that he should have become the WWF champion at some point in time. But he was a fragile guy. He wasn't always all there, you know, and he feuded with Vince and all of this and all of that. But when you talk about guys that had the million dollar look and had that large physique, that larger than life kind of persona that the WWE especially loved at that time, Ahmed Johnson on the surface, if you, when he was brought in, you said, man, this guy might be it. This guy might be a future world champion in this company. And unfortunately, it just never happened. It just didn't work out. I look at Jake the Snake Roberts, and I see a guy that, you know, he was sometimes his own worst enemy, and sometimes maybe the company took him for granted, and they kept him in a certain spot because he was always a draw. Jake the Snake was always a draw. But maybe they felt he was a good enough draw where they didn't need to put the belt on him, whatever the case might be. But he was never even intercontinental champion, let alone WWF champion. And just think about this. During the height of Hulkamania, during the height of Hogan's run, they were going to go with a Jake versus Hogan feud, but then they backed off of it. And you've heard Hogan and Jake kind of talk about that. But imagine the business they would have done. They would have set records at that time. If you have Jake the Snake chasing Hulk Hogan for the belt, and then Jake actually wins the belt, and now Hogan's got to chase him back, you actually would have had at that time what was something that was very rare. You would have had the crowd having to choose. You would have had a split crowd, and we've had it so much over the years since. You could say that led to the damnation of the business, but imagine how unique that would have been back in 1986 and 1987. Imagine how business-changing that feud and that story would have been, and imagine how captivating that would have been. The ultimate good guy. Hulk Hogan, the All-American, versus the weasel, the snake in the grass, so to speak, and Jake the Snake Roberts, the guy who's evil and mischievous and you can't trust him and you don't know where he's going or what he's going to do. What a phenomenal feud that would have been. A real moneymaker that the WWF missed out on and ultimately robbed us of as fans. I still hold that against him a little bit to this day. And the fact, you know, with all the personal demons, which I'm sure hurt Jake down the road in terms of ever getting a real top spot in the company. Yeah, you still look at him, though. He was Jake the Snake Roberts, man. When he was on, he was money, and almost nobody could touch him. One of the greatest talkers in the history of the business. Had a phenomenal look, and he had a gimmick that made him stand out and be unique and different. If you put the belt on him as a heel or a face, it didn't matter. You were still going to draw money and a lot of it. He should have been WWF champion at some point in time. And then Booker T., to round out the list. You know, you might say, well, Booker T, you know, he was world heavyweight champion in WWE, and he was a five-time WCW champion. Well, he's a five-time WCW champion at the tail end of that company's relevance and history period. He was a five-time champion in a very crappy era of WCW wrestling. You break him in with the belt, the WCW belt in 2001, and immediately have him drop it to Rock at SummerSlam that year. Come on, man. And then it took five years. It took five fucking years for this company to put the belt back on Booker T. Five fucking years. 
There was a point in time where he was just about as hot as anybody in that company, especially in like the 2002-2003 time frame. But no, WrestleMania 19, we can't have him win the World Heavyweight Championship off of Triple H. That wouldn't be good for business. We got God's reign of terror. But you're telling me at some point in time, you couldn't find a way, even when he did it with him in 2006, he had to be King Booker, and, you know, that was because Batista was there, all this other bullshit. You're telling me a guy, a legit talent like Booker T, a guy who had been established as a world champion in another company, a guy that was incredibly over with your audience and fan base, your white, Hispanic, and black audience, all of them, you couldn't find a way to make him WWF or WWE champion at some point in time. That is stupid, and that is completely ridiculous, and I refuse to buy that there was any good real business logic to be able to say that at some point in time he couldn't have held your most important belt for some period of time. Shit, you couldn't wait to put it on Brock Lesnar. What if Brock Lesnar was black? Would you have given him the same monster push, or would it have taken him a couple of years? I refuse to believe that the company would have given him that monster push. Period. And that's a fact. And the company's own history during the 50 years of the WWF, the WWF, the WWE, we've had exactly zero 100% black WWF, WWE champions. Zero. And don't throw out the fucking Rock's name. The Rock classifies himself as Samoan more than he does black, and the WWE always refers to him as Samoan. He doesn't count. And he doesn't count not because I don't say so. He doesn't count because The Rock says so. Because the WWE says so. Zero. And I emphasize again, zero black WWE champions. The World Heavyweight Championship was always the second fiddle belt. So don't throw out like Booker T and Mark Henry. They still weren't going to put the major strap on him. And you look at guys like, again, like Ron Simmons. How the fuck could you not find a way to take this legit All-American football player who was once WCW's world champion, take that guy and make him your world champion at some point in time? How could you not make Booker T the WWE champion at some point in time? I just can't believe it. Again, feel free to pipe in down below and let me know who you think are eight wrestlers that should have held the title that never did. You know, you could talk about guys like, I'm sure some of you are going to bring up like Christian or Ravishing Rick Rude, maybe Lex Luger, maybe Billy Gunn, uh, maybe R-Truth, maybe Mark Henry, you know, guys like that. There are a lot of them out there. So I'm curious to see who you think are the eight wrestlers who should have been WWE champ but never were.